There are a plethora of surveys asking people what they want out of life, and consistently the top answer is happiness. But what exactly is happiness? Is it a feeling that comes and goes? Is it a state that may last for a few days or a few weeks? Or is it something else entirely? One tool that I think can be useful for helping us understand the elusive concept of happiness is philosophy. And on today's episode, we're honored to have philosophy professor Dr. Ted Bergsma on. Professor, thank you for taking the time to do this. We're very excited to have you on. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now, before we get into happiness, can you explain a little bit about what philosophy is and why it can be useful for helping us understand how to live a good life? Yeah, absolutely. So philosophy, um, in its most basic sense, uh, has the sense of the love of wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. um, which I think already kind of gives us a immediate type of understanding of why this would be useful to us, right? Right. Um, Philosophy is typically divided into several different disciplines. I mean, we have the study of reality, broadly speaking, metaphysics, right. study of knowledge, epistemology. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, one of the earliest and uh, most important, kind of given to us by Socrates especially, mm -hmm. um, is the study of ethics. That is to say, what is the good? Right? Yes. Um, that's exactly in this context uh, that a lot of first, a lot of the most fruitful work of philosophy, I think, has been done um, exploring then not just the nature of reality or the sorts of things that we can know, but the sorts of lives that we can and should live. Yes, right. and do you know the author uh, Ryan Holiday? Yeah. So yeah, he right. speaks yeah. exactly to that point right. about, you know, one of the most uh, important aspects of philosophy is ethics and the fact that it can help us um, really ground all this stuff in very practical aspects of our lives. And I think Aristotle's concept of eudaimonia is no different. Um, it's a word that often gets mistranslated right into happiness. Yes, absolutely. Uh, can you talk about how it might be different than how we typically conceive of happiness? Yeah, absolutely. So Aristotle um, is the first one, I think, to give us the sense of, well, maybe not the first, Plato also played around with this idea, mm -hmm. um, that happiness is really the thing that all human beings are after, right? Um, right. But as you say, the term that um, he and Plato, are in fact, are using is eudaimonia, uh, right. which has more of a sense um, than what we're used to. We're normally thinking of it in terms of a feeling, right? A psychological mm. state. Yeah. And um, this is, in fact, a very new understanding of what happiness uh. is. For Aristotle, um, happiness has more of the sense of flourishing. This is mm. kind of what eudaimonia means for him. Um, and one of the interesting ways that I like to talk about it when I teach it yeah. um, is that happiness for Aristotle, eudaimonia, is something that we do, not something that we mm. feel, right? Yes. Um, it's a sort of way of living. It's a type of life that you uh, lead um, rather than a sensation or even how you feel about that life. Right, yeah. right. And a big part of living a life uh, for Aristotle, a life that flourishes, is this concept of virtues. Yes, Can you speak absolutely. a little bit about what some of these uh, virtues are, examples of them, and then how someone might live them out? Yeah, exactly. So Aristotle is, of course, the kind of canon figure, the sort of founding figure, really, of the virtue ethical tradition. Mm -hmm. And normally what we mean when we say virtue ethics is, you know, this sort of study of individual character traits, right, that make someone a good or a bad person. Right. Um, but for Aristotle, in fact, the notion of virtue is much broader, right? Mm. Um, the Greek word arete just has a sort of sense of excellence, like mm. doing well. Um, yeah. And you can still see this kind of testified to in a lot of um, even contemporary language when you're thinking, for instance, about someone who's particularly good at an instrument. You refer right. to them as virtuoso, right? Mm. That is just yes. like excellent, right? Um, and what Aristotle is interested in then is insofar as eudaimonia is the highest good, according to him, right? right. Um, it would have the center sense of living an excellent life, the best sort of life that you're capable of living. And sure. of course, the word here is virtue. Yes. Um, now for him, it's not just about you know, being a good violinist or being good at your job or something like this, but actually okay. being good or excellent relative to being a human being. Right. Um, so doing the sorts of things that human beings and human beings alone mm. um, can do, but doing them well. And it's in here that it's in this sense that he starts talking about things like courage mm -hmm. or bravery or generosity um, or wisdom and intelligence. That is to say, these ways of acting mm -hmm. uh, that demonstrate an excellent um, use of our rational capacities yeah. relative to our feelings. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So there's a big yeah. emphasis on rationality. Absolutely. Yeah. That is really essential for Aristotle. The human being is the rational animal. So to live right. a good, um, that is to say, eudaimonic human life, yeah. um, is to really engage our rational capacities in our everyday living. I think that's the essential point for him. Right. Yeah. And a big component for Aristotle seems to be having balance. Yes. So uh, you might not want to be too honest. I right. think about exactly. you know people who like always say what's on their mind. Can you speak about the concept of the 
um, the vice of being deficient in a virtue and then uh, like also the excess of that. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the ways that Aristotle understands virtues of character, right, specifically, um, that is to say what makes us who we are, um, is by ver his famous theory of the mean, right? right. Um, that is to say virtue, um, we often think about virtue as though it's sort of uh, the opposite of some type of vice, right? Like right. I, I'm courageous, which means that I'm not cowardly, right? right? Um, but for Aristotle, virtue, at least virtues of character, are always going to be a sort of middle ground position, mm -hmm. right? There's going to be a sort of excessive response in relation to a situation and a deficient response. Yeah. Um, and the examples, of course, that, I mean, yeah, honesty is always a really good one. I mean, there's, right. there's telling the truth, yes. right, uh, which is important. And then there's telling too much of the truth, right? right. Saying things that people don't really need to hear. That's not really yes. going to get the point across, Absolutely. right? Um, and then there's, of course, being dishonest. That is to say, yes. not said, telling the truth often enough, right? right. Um, or not in the right context. Mm -hmm. um, but you can think about this exactly in terms of things like bravery as well, you know? Yeah. Um, having absolutely no fear of something that is actually threatening to you yeah. um, or, you know, being terrified right, right. of something that has no uh, threat to you whatsoever. And yes. courage is exactly finding, okay, well, what's actually threatening mm -hmm. and what's the appropriate response? Right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, it seems like uh, he wants us to figure out these appropriate responses through experience, yeah, right? Absolutely. He doesn't tell us, you know, go and do exactly this and go and do exactly that. That seems more of morality, right? Exactly. So yeah. how do morals and ethics differ? Yeah, so the way that I think about it, and this, this distinction, the way that I play with it, comes from the um, 20th century French philosopher, Gilles Deleuze. Mm -hmm. um, Ethics, um, when I use the term, uh, refers to something kind of more descriptive, right? Uh, right? It's the sort of thing, as you were just alluding to a few minutes ago, and every, every human being, as a matter of fact, does seem to be after happiness, right? right? And the question is then, well, what sorts of things for Aristotle allow us to achieve that, right? right. It's a, a sort of descriptive, quasi-scientific, kind of artistic even, um, yeah. approach to these sorts of considerations. Mm -hmm. When I say morality, um, and again, this is coming from that Deleuzean framework, um, I mean something prescriptive. That is to say, okay. I'm not just telling you what is good, right? Yeah. I'm telling you what you should do, right? Okay. So one of the ways that we could talk about this is, you know, there are good and bad things in the world, right? right. And then there are right and wrong actions, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, morality is the latter and ethics is the former. Right, yeah. right. And now we talked about the importance of experience. You need right. to really go out into the world, maybe mess up so you, that you can learn these lessons right. of, you know, when to be too on, when to be honest enough right. and not too honest Absolutely. or yeah. too little. Um, but what ex what role does the academic experience have in all of this? Because yeah. it seems like you can gain so much from going out in the world and learning. But what role does, you know, sitting down and reading a book, you know, maybe an ethics book have? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for Aristotle, I think this is kind of a complicated situation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as to say, for him, your character, who you are, is ultimately always a matter of what you do. Right. Um, so it's a, ma a matter of exactly, as you say, practical experience, you know, mm -hmm. like seeing how honest I can be with somebody, right? Um, and, and as you alluded to a minute ago, not really giving hard rules about, well, you should be honest in exactly this way at exactly this time. Um, for Aristotle, there's a strong difference, I think, between, uh, you know, learning something like ethics, you know, coming into an ethics classroom and reading mm -hmm. Aristotle or reading yeah. Kant or John Stuart Mill or um, what have you, right? Um, and then actually, of course, going and, and acting this out, right? right. Um, now, of course, as we were just saying, reason matters in all of this. So having some yeah. good practical um, knowledge of the philosophical text on these issues is uh -huh. important. It helps yeah. us evaluate uh, what we can and can't do, what we should and shouldn't do. But really, it's all about the action, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the academic experience that I think you're suggesting, I mean, it's helpful. It gives us some instruction. Sure. Um, it is sort of higher order instruction that perhaps we receive from our parents or from those around us as we're growing up, right? right. But ultimately, goodness um, for Aristotle, and I think he's right on this one, is a matter of what you're doing, not what you think you're yes, doing. right? for sure. Yeah. And uh, it seems like he also... Uh, posits that you can't just achieve eudaimonia once. Right. It's something that you need to strive to achieve almost every single day. Is that yeah. the case? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, I mean, one of the things, and this is the sense in which eudaimonia is different from our sense of happiness, right? Well, right. we can think of, well, okay, well, today I feel good, yeah. right? Um, and that's something that kind of passes over time. Um, uh -huh. But happiness for Aristotle is something that you have to do throughout your whole life. It's a sort of lifelong right. training, this lifelong practice. Yeah. Um, and it's in that respect that it doesn't have the same sort of fleeting nature, right? It has to do with exactly who you are. Yeah, right? so yeah. you don't ever get to just one point and then you're happy forever. No, exactly. It's, it's something that you have to constantly work on. I mean, the example that he gives, of course, this is ancient Greece, right, is the uh, example of King Priam of Troy, right, who has yes. a huge family, is a king of an affluent um, city-state, mm -hmm. um, is supposedly a really good person, right? He does highly honored, highly respected. And then at some point, his son comes and ruins everything. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, and his whole city is sacked. His whole family is killed. Yeah. Um, 
and we can't call that type of person happy anymore, right? right? Because that sort of just horrible misfortune can yes. spoil a life. And it's in that respect, yeah, that a lot is kind of up to fortune. Yes. Uh, even when we're talking about Aristotle's notion of eudaimonia, I think. Right. And yeah. I think that absolutely should be discussed. What do you think are some of the other external factors that could affect happiness? Yeah. So for Aristotle lists several of these, um, and it, some of them are very amusing. I mean, well, <laughs> since, since for him, happiness is something that we do, right? This right. means that this activity could either be helped or hindered mm. depending on a variety of circumstances. This is the external stuff, right? right. So having virtuous friends mm -hmm. makes it easier for you to be virtuous. Right. Having vicious friends makes yeah. it harder for you to be virtuous. Uh -huh. The same sort of um, blow that up on a broader scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, not just friends, but community members, political members, right? Yes. So if you grow up in a rough, that is to say, not particularly virtuous society, it's going to be harder for you yourself to be virtuous. Right. And not impossible, of yes. course, right? Um, in the same way that, you know, a plant can grow relatively well mm -hmm. in a hostile environment, but sure. would grow better in yes. a more, um, you know, environment it's suited to its needs. Uh -huh. uh, likewise, there are certain external things. You know, the plant needs sun. We need a certain degree of wealth. You know, right. the plant needs soil. We need his friendship, right? Uh -huh. um, and things of this kind. Uh, political power is one that he lists. Right. A certain degree of physical comfort. Mm -hmm. um, health is, of course, one of these. Um, friendship, and I'm in my personal favorite, beauty, um, <laughs> he wants to insist, right? Um, yeah. That is to say, um, people treat you better if they find you attractive, so says right. Aristotle, right? Um, of course, this is problematic in a lot of ways, but again, this is the descriptive thing, not the prescriptive thing from him. Um, so there's a variety of external circumstances, some things which aren't up to you, right? Yeah. The society you're born in, how much wealth that you, your family might have, mm -hmm. um, the family that you're born into. Um, but ultimately, of course, it's always about your actions and what you do with those external circumstances right. that really determine whether or not you're living a good, virtuous life. Absolutely. And now Aristotle's theory, as good as it is, it runs into uh, a wall, I want to say, uh, in the 19th century with yes. John Stuart Mill. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not like there's one definitive winner. There are two very highly uh, thought out and uh, very competitive theories, uh, even to this day, and that's utilitarianism. Uh, and for utilitarians, it almost doesn't matter how you feel or what your intentions are. Can you speak about what they do value instead? Yeah, so utilitarianism is a philosophy, as you said, that kind of emerges in the 19th century. Um, that is what we call a consequentialist theory, right? That right. is to say, it, and it is a moral theory, I should observe too, okay. right? So as opposed to Aristotle, who's strictly ethical, strictly talking about good and bad, mm -hmm. utilitarianism is concerned with right and wrong action. And this is right. to say, who you are, what circumstances you're born into, doesn't yep. determine whether an action's right or wrong. Okay. The consequences of that action determine what's right and wrong. Right. And ultimately for utilitarians, um, it's not just a matter of any consequence. They have very specific ones in mind. That is mm. to say utilitarianism is hedonistic in nature. Okay. So its understanding of happiness is one that's fundamentally pleasure-based, sensation-based. Um, so their interest um, is in promoting as much pleasure as you can and yes. minimizing as much pain as you can. Right. And one thing I think is very interesting with John Stuart Mill is that he came along and kind of changed the utilitarian game in mm. that he posited that there are higher and level and lower levels of pleasure. Right. Can you go a little bit into what he meant by yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So one, one of the things that Mill was trying to do was solve a problem that was there in his predecessor, Jeremy Bentham, right. um, who gave us, of course, the fellowshipic calculus, which yes. was always <laughs> such a fun one to I, do. Right? <laughs> when I think of that, I think of like, if you took uh, people out of like a computer science or an engineering class and were like, okay, figure out how to become happy. Exactly. They would, they would come right. Equation, yeah. right? Right, <laughs> yeah. And of course, and it's not just become happy yourself, but make everyone as happy as yeah, possible, absolutely. right? plug in a yeah. few factors. Yeah, but one of the things that um, Mill wanted to suggest is that this isn't just a quantitative consideration. There's sure. some qualitative considerations when we're talking about pleasures. That is to say there are certain types of pleasures that are better, which is to say, in his view, more desirable than other ones. Yes. Um, and here I think he's drawing on Aristotle to some extent, right? That is uh -huh. to say there are certain things that human beings enjoy mm -hmm. specifically that we will enjoy and feel more of a desire for. Right. If we think seriously about it and, are, and if we are exposed to it often yes. enough, right? So he distinguishes between what he calls the higher and lower pleasures, the intellectual and bodily pleasures. Um, and of course, the example I always use for this one is yeah. the Haydn and the Oyster thing, right? Uh, this uh -huh. is a, from the philosopher Roger Crisp, um, where if you were given the choice ultimately to be reincarnated into a certain life and you could either be an oyster and right. experience no pain, yeah. right? Or Haydn, the great composer, mm. right? Which do you choose? Almost everyone chooses to be Haydn, right? Yes. Why? 
because Haydn achieves things, right? Yeah. Haydn is a musical genius. Haydn has family and friends. Uh -huh. And these sorts of things yeah. are pleasures, like right. the nice little oyster bath, right? Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, pleasures of a greater quality mm. uh, for Mill. Yes. Yeah. So even though he might have faced some pain throughout his life, it was still balanced out by the relative success that he uh, had and the pleasure that came with it. Exactly, right? exactly. And that's, I think, one of the things that um, Mill wants to call our attention to is his famous line, of course, that it is uh, better to be a human being dissatisfied mm. than a pig satisfied, right? Yes, um, yes. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. Right. Um, and the idea is, is look, that, that pain is bad, right? There's, there's no doubt about this one, but pain is justifiable mm -hmm. as a means to an end, right? So it's okay to have a life that has some pain in it, right? right. Indeed, this is part of what it is to be human. Yeah. Um, but what's essential is that we pursue those parts of our humanity that give mm -hmm. us these higher level pleasures. Right. right, and can you give some examples of the higher level of pleasures? Yeah, right. Um, for Mill, uh, his, uh, one of the go-to ones for him, and this is indeed very personal for him, right, um, mm -hmm. is poetry, right? right. Um, yeah, I remember that, you said yeah, it right. had a huge impact on whether or not he would you know, be depressed or not. Exactly, right. right. So he was um, fell into a really bad depression uh, in around his 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that kept him going, supposedly, was the poetry of William Wordsworth, a great right. romantic poet. Uh -huh. um, and I think this has an impact, you know, um, biographically on the sorts of things that he's suggesting here. That is to say, um, you know, the solution to a depression is not to, you know, get yourself really drunk, right. increase that type of pleasure, right? Yeah. It's to kind of get in touch with this more human side of pleasure, mm. right? On um, the sort of pleasure that really only we as humans could understand, something like yeah. poetry. Music is, of course, another one of these philosophy, of course, uh, is yeah. one. <laughs> um, but friendship, um, political activity, even virtue for him counts as something like a higher pleasure. Mm, got yeah. you. And it yeah. seems like those higher pleasures are also much longer lasting. You know, yes. if yeah. you're drunk, you're not going to be able to sustain that for right. more than a few. If you're going to be an alcoholic, you can't do it for more than a few years. <laughs> right, exactly. But uh, these more worthwhile yeah. activities that are uh, solely accomplished by humans are the ones that lead to the long lasting success that we really crave. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that's... Um, perhaps maybe a little bit incidental for him. I think that is definitely how Bentham would think about it, right? I mean, what right. I'm trying to do is make sure that I am the happiest and everyone else around me too is as happy as they can be for as long as they can be. Right? Yes. Um, and for Mill, I think the higher pleasures, there's always going to be some type of correlate there, right? Like, uh -huh. I mean, studying philosophy, uh, for instance, um, is a higher quality pleasure and is better for us in the long run than just going out and getting drunk, right? Yeah, um, that is to say, you can learn something about life, you can learn something about ethics, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for him, really, it's just a matter of desirability, right? Mm -hmm. That is to say, if we really were exposed, right, yeah. to the study of philosophy mm -hmm. and alcoholism, yeah. right, one of these becomes immediately preferable to right. us, right? That is to say, there is something in us psychologically, um, from Mill's perspective, right, that just draws us towards mm -hmm. these higher quality ones that, yes. yes, as you say, do last longer. Right, right. Yeah. right. And I think an important idea in utilitarianism is that, you know, the more it's kind of like the Spider-Man quote, with more power comes more yes, responsibility. Absolutely. Uh, the more, you know, the more you're given in life, the more that you should help other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that leads to uh, effective altruism, which yes. is uh, yeah. which came <laughs> from utilitarianism. And I think to understand effective altruism, we have to understand one of the most famous philosophers that, you know, really cemented it in our time. Uh, and that's Peter Singer. Right. Uh, yeah. Can you briefly describe uh, Peter Singer's impact on utilitarianism? Yeah, Peter Singer is uh, hands down the most uh, well-known um, and highly regarded, ultimately, uh, defender of utilitarianism today. Right. Um, Singer is most famous uh, for, well, several things, really. Um, the way that I present Singer always is his essay, early essay in the 70s, mm -hmm. uh, Famine, Affluence, and Morality, where he gives a very annoyingly compelling yeah. argument, <laughs> right? Too um, annoying. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, that from utilitarian perspective, um, yeah. that is to say from the perspective of reducing suffering to the greatest extent for the greatest amount of people, right. um, ultimately concludes with this very pesky problem yeah. of needing to surrender all of your wealth. Right? Yes. Um, so one of the things that Singer is quite well known for, um, in addition to his work on um, animal activism, I should call yes. that one out as well, um, is his concern for uh, what we might call a sort of financial ethics, that is to say okay. concern with morally what we should do with our financial resources. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. One way Peter Singer um, demonstrates this point that you just brought up is with his metaphor of walking past a pond yes. and yeah. seeing a toddler drowning. Right. 
And, uh, you know, if you're not a psychopath, if you have any human emotions, <laughs> no matter what you're doing that day, where you're going or what you're wearing, even if you're wearing a nice green suit, <laughs> um, yeah. you're going to jump into that pond and save the toddler. Right. Right. right? Yeah. And this is a metaphor for something much, much bigger and absolutely. more powerful. Right. Can you go into a little bit about what that metaphor means? Yeah, absolutely. And it, in fact, it's, it's interesting you start with Mill, of course, um, because this is Mill's idea originally. Right. Uh -huh. So this is in his book, Utilitarianism. Um, and Singer just expands on this one quite extensively. Right. Yeah. The metaphor being right. Um, that of course, um, I would surrender my suit, my nice right. shoes, the nice shoes, uh, yeah. um, in order to save someone if I knew that they were suffering. That is to say, my own personal aesthetics or my own personal financial resources yeah. shouldn't inhibit me from saving a human life. And I think intuitively wouldn't do this, right? right? Um, but one of the things that Singer wants to emphasize then um, is that the conclusion that we can reach from this mm -hmm. is if we are capable of doing something to prevent someone from suffering and dying, yeah. morally speaking, we should do that, right? Yeah. I mean, this seems what this seems to be implied in this example of the drowning child. Right. Um, that being the case, mm -hmm. we are intuitively aware yeah. that many human beings are suffering and dying all around the world, right? right? Um, and if we're aware of that, then yeah. morally speaking, mm -hmm. the concern for instance for how I look or yeah. my clothing okay. um, or my own personal benefit is not morally relevant right. in Singer's view to whether or not I should do something to prevent the suffering and death from happening, right? So yes. what he does is take this as an example to kind of appeal to our common sense moral understandings and then right. really blow it out to a not so commonsensical conclusion, yes. right? Um, that is to say, if I know that, for instance, someone across the world uh -huh. is suffering and dying, this is the famine essay, right? right. Um, from lack of food, shelter, right. um, water, protection. Uh -huh. um, and I am capable of doing something about it, right. right? for instance, by donating all of my excess income. Yeah. Then morally speaking, uh -huh. I'm required to do such a thing in the same way that I'm required to jump into the pond to save yes. the child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, you alluded to the fact that it's such a rock solid argument and that's why he's one of the most famous philosophers today. Uh -huh. um, can you explain what some of the opposing arguments would be to this, you know, really good argument? Yeah, so the opposing arguments, um, I don't know that anyone, I mean, I think this is one of the great, you know, almost tongue, tongue in cheek moments that, that Singer gives us at the beginning. Is like, look, I'm gonna start with some obvious stuff, right? Yeah. Suffering and death are bad. If right. you're not gonna agree to that, I don't yeah. know what to say to you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, we're just you not going to deeper work. questions. Exa to explore, exactly right? right. We can just stop this conversation. Right? Yeah. Um, now, if you can acknowledge that suffering and death are bad, and you can do something to stop it, right, without, as he says, compromising something of equal moral worth, mm. right. Uh, that is to say, without, in his view, causing as much suffering as I would be by. Um, mm -hmm not doing the thing in question, right? right. Then I should do it, right? Yeah. Um, now, of course, when we play it out in terms of the, um, you know, fancy shoes example, right? Yeah. Obviously, my shoes are not of comparable moral worth, right? right? Um, so that I should save the child. Mm -hmm. Likewise, buying myself a coffee is not of comparable moral worth yeah. to someone starving on the other side of the world. So I should use the money that I would use to buy myself a coffee to pay, pay for someone else, yes. right? Now, what I think people go for in this is not to attack the general idea of this because I mean I think it, suffering and death are bad right, right? if we can do something to stop that from happening we should yeah. um, what people will isolate is that comparable moral worth mm. consideration right, right. Um, so I think the most um, decided I think most convincing um, counter argument to Singer is not that um, we should ignore of course, the suffering and death on the other side of the world. We right. should absolutely not do that. Yeah. Um, but coming, for instance, from the deontologist, or Nora O'Neill, I think is especially good on this point, mm -hmm. um, that we also have obligations to people around us that we need to take into consideration, right? right? And obligations to ourselves that we need to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, such that if I'm thinking um, not just in terms of maximizing um, happiness from the utilitarian perspective or from Singer's perspective, really minimizing suffering to the greatest extent that I can. Um, but also for a deontologist, increasing things like human autonomy or human well-being, right. right? Then the same solution doesn't necessarily present itself, right? Of yeah. course I should do something, right? right? Um, do I need to go to the extreme, what uh -huh. Singer calls marginal utility of, of basically depriving myself of everything to the point where I'm starving and dying, right, right in order to save someone else? Yeah. Um, I think, for instance, the deontologist Mm -hmm. argue no, okay. right? And of course, you could even go back to Aristotle and say, well, this mm -hmm. is an excessive response, right? Oh, of course, yeah. generosity is one thing, right? right? Uh, yes, but we don't want to be uh, what Aristotle calls 
wasteful. Okay. Now, of course, that one I think is probably a little more, right? it's not really wasteful to, yes. to spend money on other people, right? Absolutely. Especially people that are suffering and dying. Uh -huh. um, but I think it's more of a matter, um, I think the deontologists have it in this respect, that is mm -hmm. to say, of weighing our obligations here and finding ways to you know, meet our own needs, right. meet the needs of those around us and meet the needs of those elsewhere or perhaps at another time. For and, sure, yeah. for sure. And yeah. I think that affects everybody because we might look at ourselves and say, okay, well, uh, I might need to do what's best for me in that moment, but then yes. I can go and use my talents in the long run and help people to an even greater extent, right? right? Absolutely. So yeah. it definitely affects our relationships with ourselves. Yeah. And that uh, goes to our next topic of um, Sam Bankman-Fried and, effect and how he altruism. took yes. effective yeah. altruism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, it was Will McCastle who really like mm -hmm. brought it into the limelight in the past five or 10 years. He wrote a book called Doing Good Better, mm -hmm. and that really uh, brought the idea to a lot of people. I think one thing that McCaskill did that was very interesting is that he convinced Sam Bankman-Fried to uh, go into crypto and to make a ton of money, then use that money to go and help more people than he would have if it was his nine to five job of yeah, helping right. everyone day to day. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So can you go a little bit into the topic of earning to give? Yeah, earning to give. I mean, I think it, it's kind of I mean, it, it's like Singer in this respect, and Singer it does defend effective altruism, right? right? I mean, it's one of those things that's kind of hard to argue against because the, it just seems so intuitively true, right? That is to yeah. say, um, one of the tenets of effective altruism is to sort of abstract away any um, personal commitments that I might have, you know, mm -hmm. like I want to put my money to this sort of activity, right. but to put it towards it's most could be most effective, right? Yeah. That is to say, uh, charities that are doing the most work to reduce something like suffering and death, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, now, this idea of, of working to give, I mean, I think this it's it's a good concept, right? I mean, right. I think any hesitation that I would have with it comes more from the emphasis, the, the decidedly consequentialist nature of, of the notion of effective altruism, right? Yeah. Um, that is to say that it is ultimately a branch of utilitarianism, and utilitarianism uh -huh. does have its issues, right? Yeah. Um, but when we're talking about excess wealth, I mean, I think it's kind of intuitive from a moral standpoint that of course taking care of yourself and your dependents is one thing right, right. um but using your money to unethical ends mm -hmm. is another and i think yes. one of the strengths of effective altruism um is that it's not for instance going the early singer route of you know abandon everything that you might have for yourself in order yeah. to help somebody else right? right but do something that's fulfilling to you do something that is yeah. um you know financially beneficial uh -huh. but in the interest of serving others, right? I mean, okay. that's the altruistic side, right? Yeah. Um, whether or not it goes to extremes, I think it, it, it often does, right? See, yeah. it's my, we're talking extremes, Aristotle, all of this uh -huh. sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think the idea that um, one's wealth should be rationally um, utilized, right? Mm -hmm. I and mean, that is, of course, utilitarianism, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's just intuitively true, right? And I think this right. is something like, even back to Aristotle, what he had in mind with the notion of generosity, right? Mm -hmm. That wealth is not to be hoarded, right? Just right. to be used for your own personal ends. Yeah. It's supposed to be put towards effective um, ways of, for instance, making other people's lives better. For sure. Because of course, thinking back to Aristotle, making yes. other people's lives better makes my life better too. Yes, right? because yeah. it strengthens those relationships exactly. and then exactly. that you have yeah. here. Um, I think this relates a lot to college students and yeah. uh, you know their choice and career. Um, but one possible downside I see with uh, earning to give and effective altruism is that it kind of strips away the humanity of it. it does, you know, yeah, you're not yeah. donating to your local charity because they aren't as effective right. as some other uh, charity in Africa, for example. Yeah, so right. do you think that might be one of the limitations of effective altruism is that it doesn't naturally uh, coincide with our instincts? I do. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that there's... Um... There's a demand in utilitarianism, and this is in other moral theories too, deontology, which I was referencing a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. um, that we be impartial, right? Yeah. When we're thinking about what we should or shouldn't do. That is to say, we don't allow our personal um, commitments or sentiments to impact what the correct moral solution is. Right. It seems a little too scientific -y for me. And indeed, this is very much what effective altruists do. They go through a complicated calcul calculations right. to figure out what the exact financial amount is to do the exact amount of good. Yes. Right? Um, it strikes me that ethics is more complicated than that, right? Uh, yeah. Ethics doesn't seem like an equation. It's not just, as you were saying, computer science, right? Right. Um, I think going back to some of the earliest ancient philosophers, um, we have this no notion of ethics as something more like an art form, mm. right? Um, that involves reason and rationality, of course, and, cho and right. choosing the right option um, right. through due consideration. Mm -hmm. um, 
But this notion, I think, that we should, indeed, are obligated to abstract away all personal commitments. Yeah. That seems to me to kind of take away, I think what you were just saying, the human element of ethical life, right? right. I mean, even in the notion of altruism, altruism, that is to say that the ethical concern for others mm -hmm. is a part of ethics. Right? Right. That is to say the relationships that I have with others, um, either immediately around me um, or all the way across the world or all the way across time in the future, as effective yeah. altruists are often concerned with. Right. right? Yeah. Um, this is part of my ethical considerations. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the issue that I have with effective altruism is that it makes it the whole of my ethical considerations. Right. Mm -hmm. So whereas yeah. you think it should be a part, they take it and expand it to be the whole. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, final question, which I hope is fun for you. Yeah. Um, so you gave me the great news when I invited you to come on the podcast that you and your wife are expecting, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. Um, so number one, congratulations Thank on that. You. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, how do you think you'll draw on your experience with philosophy uh, in, <laughs> right, your, yeah. in your experiences yeah. as a father? Yeah, you know, someone just asked me this. We just had the, oh, uh, the baby I, shower I felt this so weekend. Yeah, 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 no. <laughs> someone just had, we, we had the baby shower this weekend yeah. um, and someone from my wife's office um, oh. was talking to me and she was saying, you know, your wife is so wonderful. Uh, Joe, yeah. love you very much. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, if she comes to the office all the time, um, and whenever any of us are angry, she's like, you know, what you should do, you should read some Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's <laughs> right. awesome. Right, exactly. So we have this sort of, um, you know, a very robust uh, philosophical uh, home, me and my wife. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is going to be a very fun experience uh, getting to raise a child in that mm -hmm. light. In fact, one of my good philosopher friends just bought us a bunch of uh, philosophy for kids books, oh, nice. right? Which is wonderful. You know, like love yeah. with Plato, happiness right. with Aristotle, in fact, yes. is one of these, right? <laughs> um, I think it's really exciting, honestly, because as, um, as we were alluding to at the very beginning of the conversation, ethics is something like a lifelong practice. And a lot of it has to do with the habits that you develop, even when you're very young. Right. Um, and I think, um, when it comes to parenting, for instance, having this um, background in ethics um, is going to hopefully, right, knock on wood, but I'm a first time yeah. parent, I don't know, right? Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, make the life for my child a little bit easier to maneuver, yeah. right? Um, when Absolutely. you have a clearer sense of what goodness is, this yeah. is one of Aristotle's clear uh, inspirations for writing something like the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh -huh. When you have a clearer sense of what goodness is, it's easier to get it, right? Yes, yes. Um, it's like the archer aiming at a target. If you can see what the target is, it's easier to hit it. Right. Um, and I'm very, very excited to yeah. see um, what this little person ends up being. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I'm sure they'll yeah. have a bright future. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining the yes. podcast. Thank I had a lot much. of fun doing uh -huh. this. I hope everyone watching learned a lot. And uh, thank you to everyone involved.